Welcome to the Sumter County Museum's live book chat with author John Cribb. His new book, Old Ape, was just released on Tuesday. While we were looking forward to hosting this event in person, we're still very excited to host Mr. Cribb this evening and welcome all of our guests, both on Zoom and on Facebook. Um, I don't know that we would have been able to do this in-person event either because of the weather that we've had today. Um, I hope that all of you have stayed safe and dry with all the flooding that we've had in Sumter and the tornado warnings. Um, and just another note on the weather, we do expect some more bad weather to come the next couple hours. So just in case there's any uh, connection problems with our internet, we do apologize. Um, and we will work to resolve that as quickly as possible. If you don't foresee any at least. Uh, just to put in a plug very briefly for the museum, we are open our regular hours with safety guidelines in place. The Williams Bryce House and our Carolina Backcountry Homestead are open on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays from 10 to 5. And the Temple Sinai Jewish History Center is open on Thursdays and Fridays from 1 to 4 and Saturdays from 10 to 1. We also have some beautiful gardens on our property and some outdoor exhibits, so there's lots of room to social distance. And we have some several events and workshops coming up soon, including our annual fall backcountry Living History Day. We've changed it up a bit to fit CDC guidelines, but we'll still be dressed up in circa 1800 clothing, uh, demonstrating skills from that time, telling you stories about it, and providing some safe, interactive fun. We also have two student workshops scheduled for October and November where your children ages 8 to 17 can learn either about pottery or archaeology. And last but not least, we have scheduled Kristen Harmel, who is the author of the Book of Lost Names, for a virtual book chat on Tuesday, October 20th. This is another historical fiction book based on a true account of a young woman who saved hundreds of Jewish children from concentration camps. You can find more information on all of these events and register for them on our website at sumtercountymuseum.org. Back to tonight's events. Uh, while unfortunately you won't be able to get an autograph book in person, our wonderful local Sumter Books A Million has received signed book plates from the author that you can get when you order the book through the Sumter store. So to do this, you just go to booksamillion.com and order the book for pickup at the Sumter location. You can also visit the store or call them directly at 803-773-1091 and they'll even do curbside pickup. Uh, we'll have that information again for you at the end of the event. Um, we're also going to have some time for Q&A at the end, so if you're in the Zoom webinar, please feel free to type in questions in the chat box during the program. We'll have that information again. Oh, excuse me. Uh, so we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. And I want to thank our Education and Visitor Services Manager, Amanda Cox, and volunteer Trevor Bachnight for handling the tech aspects of tonight's events. Amanda has been very active managing our social media pages and developing other virtual programs for us during this very strange time. If you aren't following us yet on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, I encourage you to check it out. Amanda's going to help moderate tonight's event and handle the questions at the end. I'm going to go ahead and introduce the author, and then I will let him take over. John Cribb is a New York Times bestselling author who has written about subjects ranging from history to education. His previous work includes co-authoring The American Patriot's Almanac with Bill Bennett and The Educated Child with Bennett and Chester E. Fenn, co-editing The Human Odyssey, a three-volume world history text, and developing online history courses. He worked as Bill Bennett's collaborator on the New York Times number one bestseller, The Book of Virtue. John's writing has been published in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, the Chicago Tribune, National Review Online, and several other publications. During the Reagan administration, he served at the Department of Justice, the Department of Education, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. He is also a co-founder of Bulletin Intelligence, a digital publisher of open source intelligence briefings headquartered in Reston, Virginia. A native of Spartanburg, he studied literature at Vanderbilt. He lives in Spartanburg with his wife and two daughters. 
thank you for being here tonight. We can't wait to hear all about old age. Well, thank you, Annie. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, you know more about me than you, you'd want to know now. Um, but I'm glad to be here. I, I, I love talking to people with about Lincoln. So uh, I, I really appreciate uh, your having me. And I'm sorry that it's so wet there. And it's wet here, too. So I told Amanda and Annie, I hope you don't hear the uh, the rain coming down the gutter outside of our window too much. If you do speak up, and I'll, I'll try to do something to, to, to quiet it down. But anyway, thanks thanks for having me. I do, like I say, I love talking to people about Lincoln, I, I, and uh, I really do. And of course, I love talking about my new novel, Old Abe, uh, which I wrote because I do, do love Lincoln so much, and I want people to know him and hopefully love him uh, like I do. So I think we need Lincoln um, more than ever these days. So I thought, um, since we're in the, the thick of a presidential campaign here, for better or worse, I thought we could take a break from 21st century uh, politics for just a little while and talk about 19th century politics and go back 160 years to the election of 1860 when Lincoln ran for president. So uh, I will just talk about him for a little while and then you know, I'd be love to, to talk to him about, uh, with you about him and answer any questions you have. And stuff. So I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to, try to throw some PowerPoint uh, slides up on the screen. We'll see if this works. We practice it once before. So hopefully this is gonna and work. And Annie and I are going to go away so we can give you and your PowerPoint. Okay. The whole screen. <laughs> All right, let's see what let's see what happens here. Don't go too far. Okay. Just in case. All right. Hold on. All right. You got a full screen of a of a campaign banner there. Is that I'll, unless I hear from you, I'll, I'll assume we have a uh, a successful full screen. Yes, we do. Okay. So that. That's a, a campaign flag from the 1860 election. As you'll see, um, uh, they spelled his name wrong. It says Abram Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln was such an unknown when he was first elected that a lot of the people that, you know, the newspapers and even his supporters just didn't even know how to spell his name. It took, took him a while to figure it out. So early on, he's, he, they spelled it Abram. Um, but before we talk about his run for the presidency in 1860, let me just give you a real quick uh, you know, the bird's eye overview of his life and political career before he ran for president. So I think, as we all know, Lincoln was born in a log cabin in 1809 in Kentucky. And then when he was about ten, uh, eight years old, his family moves across the Ohio River into uh, southern Indiana. And they settle down in a little, tiny little settlement called Little Pigeon Creek, about 15 or 20 miles from the Ohio River. And Bill, that's a recreation of the uh, log cabin they lived in there on the right. And so they're pretty much out in the middle of nowhere. But even though Lincoln grows up in the middle of nowhere, he's exposed to politics early on because, you know, they didn't have TV. They didn't have the Internet. They didn't have cell phones. They stared out all day long. But believe it or not, in their spare time, people actually talked to each other and they would swap news and newspapers would float through the area, and they might be weeks old, but by the, you know, by the time they got out to the frontier, but there was still news to those people. And so they read them, they devoured them, they read them aloud to each other, and they had stories about politics and people like Andy Jackson and Henry Clay and their speeches, and so they would, uh, you know, Lincoln grew up uh, with his stuff exposed to politics. So when he's about um, 21 years old, his family moves again. Uh, this time they move across the Wabash River into uh, Illinois, and he ends up in a tiny little little frontier town called uh, New Salem, Illinois, uh, just west of Springfield. Um, it's got about 100 people in it, which was the, uh, the size of Chicago at the time, believe it or not. And this is, there are a lot of famous stories about him uh, when he's a young man. Spent, he spends a few years there. Uh, he's, uh, that on the left there is a recreation of the uh, general store he had with a guy named Bill Bar Barry. So he's a clerk in that general store and co-owner. Um, he's the village postmaster. He's a surveyor. This is uh, where he begins to um, study law uh, on his own. That statue on the right, everybody who's been to Brooklyn Gardens knows Anna Hyatt Huntington. That's the uh, Anna Hyatt Huntington uh, statue at uh, New Salem, Illinois. He's reading that law book as he rides along. And this is where he enters politics, this little village in New Salem, because in 1832, some friends convinced him to run for the state legislature. You know, it's a good way for a young man to rise in the world. So Lincoln does that. He loses this election in 1832, but he's not going to give up. So he runs again in 1834, and this time he's elected, and he spends uh, four terms in the Illinois state legislature. Um, in 1837, he moves again 
just up the road to uh, Springfield, the brand new state capital of Illinois. And this is where he uh, meets and courts and marries Mary Todd Lincoln there on, on the left. And they raise a family. And that's the old state house in Springfield uh, there on your right, where he uh, serves in the Illinois legislature. And this is where he becomes a very successful uh, prairie lawyer and rises in the world of politics. And in 1846, he runs for Congress. Uh, this is, I believe, the first known photograph of Lincoln uh, of the year he runs for Congress. He's elected to Congress. He spends one term in the U.S. Congress in Washington. That's the only experience he has holding office at the national level before he's elected president, believe it or not, just that one term. So he goes to Washington, he spends a term in Congress, and then he comes back to, uh, to Illinois. And for the next uh, several years, uh, he, he's out of elective office. Um, he has a hand in politics, but he's, he's not in office. I'm not sure he expected to be in office again, but he's concentrating on building up his law practice and of course, raising his family. Um, that changes in 1854. And uh, you may remember uh, from your school days that uh, Congress passes the Kansas-Nebraska Act. That is an, a law that opens the door for slavery to spread out of the South into those Western territories and even up North, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Uh, this alarms a lot of people, including Lincoln. He jumps back into politics at this point. He runs for the U.S. Senate in 1854 uh, from Illinois. He loses uh, that election though. But again, he's not gonna give up. So in 18, uh, four years later, 1858, he runs for Senate again. This time he runs against Stephen Douglas, a Democrat uh, from Illinois. And that 1858 Senate election, that's the election of the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. Uh, uh, Stephen Douglas and Abraham Lincoln slugging it out, seven debates across uh, the state of Illinois, seven different towns, and they're debating the great issues of the day including and especially uh, slavery. Uh, so Lincoln loses this election too, but these debates are so great that uh, and so interesting that a lot of newspapers follow them and they report on them, newspapers around the country, and they, uh, they print excerpts from the debates. So, and people all over the country read them. And so Lincoln uh, raises his, his recognition level to a, uh, to a point where it's never been before, you know, at a national level because of these debates. So he loses this election in 1858. And towards the end of that year, uh, he is in Bloomington, Illinois, one day on legal business. And he runs into a friend of his named uh, Jesse Feld, who's a fellow lawyer and a political ally and a businessman. And Jesse Feld grabs him and says, come here, Lincoln, I want to talk to you. And he pulls him into his brother's law office and he sits him down and he says, you know, I've been traveling back east and people are talking about you and these great debates you had. And he says, I think you ought to run for president. And Lincoln's reaction is, you are nuts. Uh, he says, nobody's going to vote for me for president. That's what he says. I don't know if that's what he really thinks. But that's what he says. And, and Fell says, well, you know, think about it. He says, you know, you're born in a log cabin, man of the people. You're a self-made man. You've uh, had these great debates taking a good strong stand against slavery. Uh, I think you ought, to, you ought to think about it. So Lincoln does begin to think about it. And as, as he says, the taste is in my mouth a little, he says, the taste is in my mouth a little. So he starts to write letters to, uh, you know, friends and supporters to kind of testing the waters, lining up support. He goes to New York City, gives a big speech at Cooper Union there about, about slavery, gets a lot of attention for that. Uh, he does a speaking tour of New England to kind of raise his profile there and test the waters there. And then he heads back to Illinois. So that brings us to the spring of 1860, May of 1860, which is where my, my book, uh, my novel, Old Abe, picks up. Because in that, uh, in the spring of 1860, the Republicans of Illinois hold a state convention in Decatur. Now, Lincoln is a Republican at this point. He's been a Whig. Uh, his whole political life. Uh, but the Whig Party has, has kind of fallen apart. And so Lincoln has helped found the Republican Party, party which is it's founded largely to combat the evil of slavery. Um, so the Republicans of Illinois gather in Decatur to, dis to decide who they would like to see uh, be the Republican nominee for president in 1860. And they built a temporary convention hall uh, out of some sticks of timber, and, and they rent a circus tent for a canvas roof. They call it the Wigwam. And uh, about 2,000 of these, these delegates and other Republicans cram in there. 
And uh, the day they, they, they kind of decide who they want to be the nominee, they want to, you know, support as a nominee. Uh, they're all crammed in there. Lincoln's at the back of the hall and they, they pick him up and they hoist him up over their, their heads and they pass him hand to hand over the sea of heads. Like they used to do people at football games, you know, passing people up uh, the stadium. My wife got passed up uh, through the crowd once or twice in, in her day. Um, so they set him down on that stage there at the front of the room and everybody's screaming and yelling and hollering. And then the crowd parts and these two guys come walking up through the middle uh, and each of them is holding upright in their hands uh, a, an old fence rail. And between these fence rails is stretched a sign that says, Abraham Lincoln, the rail candidate for president in 1860. And one of these guys is Lincoln's cousin, John Hanks. And when Lincoln and John Hanks were younger men, they spent a lot of time out on the Illinois uh, prairies uh, cutting, uh, splitting logs, splitting logs to make uh, fence rails to make split rail fences. And the Republicans have gone out and dug up a couple, a couple of these fence rails and made this uh, campaign poster out of it. So they come walking up the, the front of the hall and everybody's screaming and yelling and hollering. And they start to yell at Lincoln, um, identify your work, identify your work. And Lincoln uh, looks at this and he says, I'm not sure, but I can. Uh, he says, I, 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 uh, I'm, 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 says, they don't look like they're a credit to their maker. And the crowd yells, identify your work. And Lincoln says, well, boys, I may, it may be that I split these rails a long time ago, I can only tell you, I split a lot better looking ones in my day. And everybody screams and yells and throws their hats in the air and they proceed to nominate Lincoln or, or name Lincoln as the, as the man they would like to, uh, to see as uh, the Republican nominee. So this convention, after it's over, Lincoln uh, gets together with his advisors, his campaign team, and they meet nearby in a patch of woods. They sprawl out on the ground to lay plans because the Republican National Convention is only one week away and it's gonna be held just up the road in Chicago, right in Lincoln's backyard. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, the Democratic Party, uh, everybody expects them to split over the issue of slavery. So whoever gets that Republican nomination is likely to win the general election and be president. However, Lincoln is a long shot. There are three or four guys that are better known in Republican circles and more likely to get that nomination, particularly William Henry Seward, of New York uh, there on the left. He's been governor and center of New York is much better known. He's a leading candidate. But each of these other fellows, there's something about them that, you know, there's a problem with each of them. Uh, either they're, they, they're considered too radical to win the general election, or maybe they've said something that has made one group or another mad at them. Lincoln, on the other hand, is not the first choice um, of a lot of people, but most of the delegates would be okay with him. So Lincoln tells his advisors, he says, our strategy is going to be to give offense to no one, leave them in the mood to come to us, should they have to give up their first love, he says. So he sends his team off to uh, Chicago, and he goes uh, back to Springfield. And about a week later, the Republican National Convention opens in Chicago, and they've got an even bigger wigwam that they build there um, for this, uh, this convention, and thousands of, of uh, people gather in Chicago to uh, choose the Republican nominee. So the day comes when they're gonna do that. Lincoln is not there. Back then it was considered ungentlemanly and crass for the, uh, the candidates to actually show up at a political convention. I was just getting your hands too dirty with politics. So they tended to, to stay away. So Lincoln follows that, that, that tradition. The day they decide that, you know, they choose the nominee, Lincoln's back home in Springfield, Illinois. And he gets up early that morning. Uh, this is the Lincoln home in Springfield. It's open to the public today, so if you ever go there, be sure to go. It's a great place. And he gets up that morning, and he, uh, you know, he go, he does his chores. He goes out in the bar and milks the cow, feeds the horse, chops some wood for the fire. He bring, pumps some water from the well, brings it into Mary. Then she gives him a quick breakfast, and then he puts on his jacket and tie, and then he walks the few blocks down uh, from their house to downtown where his law office is, just off the public square on the west side of the square. Uh, this is, uh, you're looking at the west side of a square, that's Washington Street. His office would have been kind of up on the, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but it would have been up on the kind of a right hand uh, edge of the, the photo. Um, so he goes into his law office. It's a, um, it's a second floor office. He goes up there and he, you know, he tries to do some work, tries to read some newspapers. He's just too distracted. So he, um, he uh, after a while, he goes downstairs and he walks back across the square past the state capitol there where he served in the legislature. 
And he finds some friends of his who are playing a game of handball outside in, a, in an alley, a vacant alley, and they're whacking that ball up against the back of a, a, a building. It's a, it's a game called Fives. And he plays handball with them for a while. And then one of them says to him, uh, you know, Jim Conklin just got in on the night train from Chicago. He might have some, some, some info for you. Jim Conkling is an attorney in Springfield, a friend, a political ally. So Lincoln walks back across the square and he goes and finds, goes to Jim Conkling's office and goes and flops down on his sofa and uh, he says, what do you know? And Conkling looks at him and says, you're going to be nominated by nightfall. And Lincoln says, no, 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 that's not going to happen. It's crazy talk. And uh, they talk a little while and Lincoln pumps him for, inf for information and then he says, well, I'm going to go back to my office and try to practice some law. So he goes back to his law office and uh, tries to get some work done. And after a while, his friend E.L. Baker, who was the editor of the Republican-leaning newspaper in Springfield, comes in, and he has with him a telegram. And it has the results of the first round of ballots in uh, Springfield, I mean, I'm sorry, in Chicago, uh, from that convention. And he shows it to Lincoln, and uh, Lincoln looks down on it, and it says, uh, William Henry Seward, who is the, as I say, the leading candidate, has 173 and a half votes from those delegates. One of those delegates uh, split his vote, 173 and a half uh, votes. Lincoln, 102 votes. And then the other candidates have, you know, different other, other amounts. That's about what Lincoln thought he would get on the first round of ballots. He, he had set out to get about 100 votes. And then he said after that, as they go to the second and third rounds, uh, he thought delegates would start to move away to other candidates. But he says to Baker, he says, um, let's walk over to the, the newspaper office. Maybe we'll get you know, faster information over there. So they walk back across the square to the newspaper office, but on the way they pass the telegraph office and they decide to go in there. They go into the telegraph office and wait around. And then another telegram comes in with the, the results of a second round of balloting. And they show it to Lincoln and he looks down at it and it says, William Henry Seward, 184 and a half votes. Lincoln, 181. And Lincoln looks down at that and he thinks, holy cow, uh, somehow my guys are doing it. They're twisting arms. They're probably making all kinds of bargains they shouldn't be making, but somehow they are doing it because that gap between Seward and Lincoln has collapsed to almost nothing. So he looks down at, and, and, and in a state of shock, he says, I, I find no fault with this. He says, I do believe they will, might well nominate me on the third ballot. So in, in, in a stunned state, he and some friends walk over to a newspaper office to, to wait around to see what happens next. And more friends gather and they wait nervously. And after a while, more telegrams come saying to Lincoln, you are nominated. Uh, glory to God, we did it. And everybody starts to scream and yell and, you know, pound each other on the back and throw their hats in the air and yell the news out the window and bells ring and guns go off. And Lincoln, uh, he says, uh, well, gentlemen, there's a there's a little woman over on 8th Street who is probably more interested in this news than I am. I think I'll, uh, I think I'll go home and, and give it to her. So he walks home and gives Mary the news that he has been chosen as the Republican nominee for president. So uh, at that point, they, uh, the campaign moves into the general election, general campaign phase. And as predicted, the Democratic Party splits. So Lincoln has, uh, you know, the Republicans have chosen Lincoln. Uh, the, the Democrats split over the issue of slavery. They, they have disagreements about what to do about that. The Northern Democrats nominate Stephen Douglas, Lincoln's old political foe is from, foe from the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Um, the Southern Democrats nominate John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky. And then the, there's a, 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 new, a, a third party, the Constitutional Union Party, nominates uh, John Bell. Now, the campaigns were a little bit different back then. Uh, you know, today... Candidates go flying all over the country, giving speeches and fundraising and all that stuff. You know, as long as, you know, maybe not today quite so much as much, uh, much with coronavirus, but um, that's what they usually did. Back then, again, it was considered ungentlemanly and rude for the candidates to, uh, to be doing that. So they tended to stay at home and let their surrogates go out and campaign for them. So Lincoln decides to follow that tradition, and he stays in Springfield for the campaign. Uh, the governor of Illinois is a guy named uh, John Wood. And he puts the state house, his office at the state house at Lincoln's disposal. And uh, Lincoln goes there for a few hours every day and he just throws the doors open and anybody who wants to come see him can come see him. Uh, you know, uh, journalists, politicians, farmers, shopkeepers. And so people come see him to shake his hand and, you know, hear him tell a joke or two or 
give him some advice. They bring him presents. Uh, ladies knit socks for him to take to the White House. And uh, they uh, somebody brings him a whistle made out of a, out of a pig's tail. And a couple of people uh, whittle uh, little statues of him out of fence rails, stuff like that. Um, meanwhile, the uh, Republican campaign machine, though, does kick into gear. And in, in the newspapers and, and magazines of, of the day, and they begin to paint this picture of uh, Abe Lincoln, the rail splitter, you know, born in a log cabin, a man of the axe and the plow. He's, uh, he's split enough rails to stretch from the North Pole to the South Pole. And he's, uh, he's honest, Abe. He's never told a lie in his life. That on the right is, a, um, is some, uh, the cover of some uh, sheet music, a campaign song that somebody wrote. And you can see right under his uh, his photo, his picture there, uh, he's actually, he signed it there. It says, you're truly A. Lincoln. Um, so, you know, the, the campaign uh, pick, uh, kicks into gear in the newspapers and the magazines. The uh, Democrats, as you can imagine, uh, were not quite as kind to him in their newspapers and magazines. They call him old ape. Uh, they say he is, was a uh, third-rate politician, um, a uh, fourth-rate lawyer, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, they, uh, they, they, call, there, there's some, you know, there's just some racial ugliness that, that is present in the campaign. They call him, they say he's a mulatto. They call him the African gorilla. Uh, they say he wants to uh, destroy the white man so the black man can be free, um, that, that kind of thing. So, as I say, Lincoln does not go out on the campaign trail, but the campaign uh, comes to him. At one point, the Republicans of Illinois throw this huge rally uh, all over the state of Illinois. About 50,000 Republicans from Illinois and, and the Midwest come to Springfield. And Springfield was a town of only 10,000 people, so it just overwhelms the town. But they hold uh, this big parade that goes past the Lincoln House which you, that you see there. And uh, Lincoln is standing right to the, uh, the right of the door there, kind of towering over everybody in white uh, right there. But um, uh, they have, you know, glee clubs and bands and floats. Like there's a there's a float with with a log cabin on wheels and, you know, a guy splitting logs in the front yard. And it takes three hours for this this uh, this parade to go past the house. And when it's done, everybody goes out to the fairgrounds outside of town for a big, you know, big rally. And a couple of Lincoln's friends say to him, you know, let's go out and check it out. And so Lincoln says, okay, I'll go as long as I don't have to to make any speeches. So they get in a carriage and they go out there. But when the crowd realizes he's there. They get so excited, they begin to mob this, uh, this, this carriage and they're climbing all over the top of it and trying to reach in through the windows and crawl in and you know, touch him and shake his hands. Somebody unhitches the horse, so they, they're stranded, they can't go anywhere. And people start to crush against each other. You know, people are getting mashed up against sides of the carriage. Somebody's gonna get hurt. Uh, finally, some of Lincoln's friends, uh, they get a horse and they, they jam their way through the crowd and they, get, they back it up to the carriage and they pull him out and they kind of wedge their way back through the crowd and, and they, uh, they get him to safety. So uh, finally, the big day arrives, November 6th, 1860, election day. And Lincoln, you know, Lincoln has, knows he has a very good shot because the Democrats are divided, but, but you know, you just never know what's gonna happen. So he's nervous. Um, so he spends a good di bit of the day at the state house, just kind of greeting supporters. Uh, uh, one point he walks across the square to the courthouse to vote. Back then it was considered uh, very rude to vote for yourself. Times have changed a little, but that's, that's what it was back then. So he takes the ballot and he cuts off the top of the ballot that has the presidential election on it. And he votes in some local elections and he drops that in the box. Goes back to the state house. At one point he goes home and Mary gives him dinner and then back to the state house. As evening comes on, the crowds begin to build uh, because they know that the returns are gonna come in over the telegraph wires. And um, so they build, and the, the early returns look good from the beginning. Um, but as night falls, Lincoln walks with a smaller group of friends over to the newspaper office to anxiously await uh, news and see what's going to happen. And sometime after midnight, the results from New York State come in, and they put him over the top. Back then, you needed 152 votes, electoral votes, to win the presidency. He wins with 180 votes. And you can see from this map here, that he sweeps the north and he takes the two states out west, uh, California and Oregon, all that area in gray in between, and those were territories, so they did not vote in presidential elections. As you can see, he does not too, do too well in the south there. Um, Breckenridge takes all the states in the lower south. As a matter of fact, Lincoln does not get one single vote in the south. And when 
electoral vote. I mean, he doesn't get set one single vote in the whole lower South. Uh, that's uh, some of the, some of the reason for that is because they they kept his name off the ballot uh, in the South. So you couldn't vote for Abraham Lincoln either, even if you wanted to in the South. So anyway, the, uh, New York returns come in uh, and they put him over the top. And so he's been elected and everybody starts to scream and yell again and, you know, throw their hats in the air and shout the news out the window and bells are ringing and guns are going off. And Lincoln, uh, after a few minutes, he says, I think I'll go down and tell Mary about it. So he walks home and says to Mary, Mary, we are elected. We are elected. So um, he has been elected uh, president. Um, and so he enters his transition phase um, and he stays in Springfield uh, for those weeks leading up to his presidency. Um, and again, he goes to the state house uh, a lot of days and just kind of greets uh, people, uh, throws the door open and people come to see him. Now the job seekers come out of the woodwork. You know, people who want, you know, they want federal jobs. They want to be postmasters or, you know, judges or light housekeepers or something. So they're coming out from everywhere. And they, they even, they show up at his house. Lincoln said he has to look under his bed uh, before he goes to sleep at night to make sure there are no job seekers under there. Um, so uh, they're, they're crawling over the place. Unfortunately, the death threats begin right away too. Um, the rumors circulate right away that he's going to be poisoned before he leaves Springfield or shot as soon as he gets to D.C. Uh, letters come uh, threatening him or withdrawings of knives or guns and them. A painting arrives from South Carolina showing him with a, uh, you know, a, a, a noose around his neck, his feet chained, his body tarred and feathered. Uh, these threats will continue uh, all the way through his presidency, uh, right, right to the very end. Uh, this is the period when he begins to put together that famous team of rivals cabinet uh, that he, uh, that he's so famous. You know, he takes the men who ran against him for the Republican nomination and he puts them into his cabinet. And he does that for several reasons. Uh, one is that he knows these men have more experience and uh, knowledge in some ways uh, with politics and governing than he does. And he wants, he wants to, to learn from them. Lincoln uh, is a great learner, um, you know, and he's a great listener. He's a famous talker, of course. He's great at telling stories and jokes. They said he was so, so funny he could make a cat laugh. But he's also a great listener. And um, he, he learns by listening as well as reading. And he does a brilliant job of, of uh, learning on the job when he's president. That's one reason he's such a great leader. So he forms his team of rivals cabinet. Um, this is also when he grows his beard. You know, we always think of Lincoln with his beard, but uh, he, he didn't have it when he ran for president. He was clean shaven. But uh, during the campaign, he gets this letter from this, uh, this young girl in Westfield, New York named Grace Bedell. And she says, all the ladies like whiskers and they would tease their husbands to vote for you. Uh, if you grow that beard, and then you would be president. So after he's elected, he decides to take her advice and grows that, uh, that beard. I, I believe this is the first known photograph of him uh, with a beard. You can see it's, it's coming in there. Um, he, uh, this is, well, well meanwhile, um, this, the, the South is growing increasingly alarmed over, uh, over Lincoln's election. Uh, rumors are sweeping the South that Lincoln is an abolitionist. As soon as he gets into office, He's going to uh, free all the black people, make them citizens. Uh, so the white people will have, you know, black people on their juries and their schools, on their legislatures. Uh, and uh, the talk of secession starts up right away uh, around the South in different places. People, you know, they hang Lincoln's image and effigy and, uh, and uh, they hang his effigy. Uh, people begin to wear ribbons that, and badges that say things like resistance to Lincoln is obedience to God. Um, Lincoln thinks all this talk of secession is overblown. He really misjudges the situation. Uh, he thinks that after he's in office, the Southerners will realize that he's, you know, he's not a bad guy after all. He says Southerners have too much good sense to secede. Um, and so he, uh, as I say, he kind of misjudges it. He thinks it's, uh, this is going to die down. But of course, then, uh, as we all know, in December 1860, uh, South Carolina goes out of the Union and things quickly spiral out of control. Other states begin to follow uh, federal force, uh, uh, southern forces around the south uh, begin to seize federal installations. Uh, the guns in Charleston Harbor are, are swung around and aimed at, at Fort Sumter where that federal garrison is, uh, is holed up. In January 1861, uh, the Star of the West, um, you know, approaches 
uh, Charleston Harbor with uh, supplies and reinforcements and the guns in Charleston Harbor fire at it. So it turns around and goes back out to sea. The next month in February, uh, delegates from around the South gather in Montgomery at the state house there on the left. And they, uh, they form the Confederate States and they choose as their uh, president, Jefferson Davis there on the right. They choose as their vice president. I should have a picture of him up, I, I don't, but um, they choose as the vice president, Alexander Stevens of Georgia, who's a friend of Lincoln's. Alex Stevens and Lincoln served together in Congress. They were fellow Whigs, uh, they like each other. So Lincoln is uh, disappointed and I think dismayed and shocked when uh, his friend Stevens is chosen to be vice president and, um, and accepts, accepts the job. So this fellow that is, you know, he's, he served one term, well, four terms in the Illinois State House and one term in Congress. And he is about to be uh, president and face the greatest crisis that the, that the country has ever known. Um, so he spends those last few weeks frantically getting ready. Uh, he's still got a lot to do um, before he can be president. Uh, for one thing, he's got to write his inaugural address. His, his brother-in-law has a grocery store on the uh, town square in Springfield. So um, there's a vacant room above it with a desk in it. So Lincoln goes there for a couple of hours uh, for a few days and writes his inaugural address. He needs to say goodbye to his stepmother, uh, Sarah Bush Lincoln, also known as Sally Lincoln. Very important figure in Lincoln's life. Um, Lincoln's mother, Nancy Hanks Lincoln, dies when he's around 10 years old and his father, Tom Lincoln, remarries. And uh, Sally Lincoln is his stepmother and becomes a second mother to him. Um, she's living on a farm about 80 miles east of Springfield where she and, and Lincoln's father had moved uh, many years before that. Uh, Lincoln's dad, Tom Lincoln, is, uh, is, has passed away at this point, but Sally's still living out there. So Lincoln takes a series of trains out to Coles County, Illinois, to tell her goodbye. Um, she had not wanted him to be elected president. And when, when, when he comes to tell her goodbye, she says, uh, she says, Abe, I'm scared they're going to kill you and, and I'll never see you again. Uh, he says, no, Mama, that, that won't happen. Trust in the Lord. All, all will be well. It is, in fact, the last time they ever see each other. Uh, and uh, he, uh, she outlives him uh, after he's assassinated. So he tells uh, his stepmother goodbye. Then he goes back to uh, Springfield. There's still a lot to do. Um, they need to figure out what to do with their house there on the left. Uh, they don't want to sell it because they figure they're only going to be gone for a few years. So they rent it out to the president of the Great Western Railroad for $350 a year. It's a pretty good deal, isn't it? And they, um, they sell most of their furniture to neighbors and other people and uh, kind of clean stuff out. Mary Lincoln, much to the chagrin of historians today, I'm sure she takes a bunch of old letters and papers and stuff and she just takes them out in the back of the house and just burns them, you know, just to get rid of them. They have to figure out what to do with uh, the dog, Fido, their, uh, their yellow mutt. Um, Lincoln uh, decides that Fido might not do too well on the train ride to Washington. So uh, much to his boy's uh, disappointment, I'm sure. So they find some neighbors to take care of, uh, of Fido. And then they move out of their house and spend the last few nights in a hotel in downtown Springfield, the Chenery House. Lincoln uh, spends the last afternoon in Springfield with his law partner, Billy Herndon. Uh, they've been partners for many years. It's been a great partnership. So they, they you know, meet in, in their office and just kind of wrap up legal affairs that need, uh, need attending to. Um, Lincoln asks Billy Herndon if he wants to go to Washington and get a job there. And Billy says, no, thanks. I'll, I'll stay here. It's probably to Lincoln's relief a little bit because uh, even though Billy was a great partner, every once in a while he had a tendency to drink too much. So you know, Lincoln might have been fine with him staying, staying back. So anyway, they wrap up their, uh, their affairs and then they, they go outside and as they leave Lincoln, um, he looks up at the, the shingle hanging outside the door there. It says Lincoln and Herndon on it. And he says, he tells Billy Herndon, he says, let it hang there undisturbed. He says, uh, if I live, I'm coming back and we'll go on practicing law together as if, as if nothing ever happened. So he says goodbye to his partner, and uh, they spend that last night in the Chenery House in Springfield, and then they get up the next morning, and they throw their last, you know, belongings that need to be packed into a couple of traveling trunks, and Lincoln gets some rope, and he ropes them up. He goes into the hotel office, and he gets some cards that say uh, the Chenery House on him. He flips them over, and he writes on the blank side, he writes, A. Lincoln, the Executive Mansion, Washington, D.C., and he tacks them to these uh, traveling trunks to make sure they, they get where they need, they need to go. And then he gets in an omnibus, which is a large carriage, and rides with a group of friends uh, over to the railroad depot just a few blocks away, the Great Western Railroad Depot, 
where a special train has come to take him to Washington. And uh, he's surprised when he gets there, there's a good, good sized crowd there to uh, see him off. It's a cold winter morning, February 11th, 1861. It's one day before his birthday. But, uh, you know, these friends and neighbors and well-wishers have gathered to see him off. And so he decides he better, you know, give a quick little farewell speech. So he steps up on the rear platform of the train there and gives an impromptu farewell address. And it's just um, six or eight sentences long. So I'm going to close by reading uh, that little farewell address to you that he gives to the uh, people of Springfield. He says, my friends, uh, no one not in my situation can appreciate my feeling of sadness at this parting. To this place and the kindness of these people, I owe everything. Here I've lived a quarter of a century and have passed from a young man to an old man. Here my children have been born and one is buried. I now leave not knowing when or whether ever I may return with a task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington. Without the assistance of that divine being who ever attended him, I cannot succeed. With that assistance, I cannot fail. Trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good, let us confidently hope that all will yet be well. To his care commending you, as I hope in your prayers, you will commend me. I bid you an affectionate farewell. And with that, Lincoln steps inside the train and it uh, pulls away. And uh, it is, um, it's the last time he is ever in Springfield. And with the exception of a few friends and, you know, others, colleagues that, that go to visit him in, uh, in Washington, it's the last time that the people of Springfield ever see him alive. The next time they see Lincoln, uh, he will be coming back um, in a casket. So we'll leave old Abe as he goes chugging off down the tracks to uh, try his hand at becoming president uh, as, it, as the country plunges into this great crisis. If you want to know the rest of the story, you know where to find it. I have to give a brief commercial for my book here real quickly, or my publisher, publisher will be very angry with me. Um, it is Old Abe. Uh, it's a historical novel, and it, it uh, follows Lincoln through the last five years of his life. So it starts in the uh, spring of 1860 with that Decatur uh, convention, and then you are at, at Lincoln's side, every chapter, every scene, uh, for the next five years as he goes through the presidency and the uh, Civil War. And uh, I worked hard to make it as historically accurate as I could. Um, everything that you read about happened and most of the characters walking on and off the pages, they were real people like Mary Todd Lincoln and their sons and Ulysses S. Grant. Um, and I, I chose to write it as fiction, historical fiction, uh, because I wanted to try to bring him alive as a walking, talking, breathing fellow. Um, so I hope I've been able to do that. And uh, I also hope uh, that if you read this book, it will help remind you and help you understand what an extraordinary service he performed for this nation, because uh, he really was uh, a giant hero, the giant hero in that epic struggle to save the, the Union, you know, save our country, uh, defend our founding principles, and free millions of enslaved Americans. I think that you understand the American story better if you understand Lincoln's story, because in a lot of ways he stands uh, center stage in that story. So that is my uh, commercial for Old Abe. I will see if I can get out of, let's see if I can stop share here. Let me try that. Did that work? I get that. Can y'all, Amanda, can you see me again? Um, yes. <laughs> okay, good, good. All right, well, I'm sure you've you may have already heard more than enough about me uh, from me about all day, but I would love to answer any questions or. Um... Well, that, I mean, I think that that was a great overview. And I actually, so what I'd love for everyone to do, if you have questions, um, you may have seen Trevor for a second. He is monitoring our live stream on over on Facebook. So Trevor, if there are um, any questions on there, type them in the chat over here. And I actually have prepared a few questions for you. Okay. And uh, we, we talked, um, we didn't really talk about it too much because part of it is a little trivia. <laughs> All right. And uh, let's see. Now, just sort of at the beginning, uh, whenever Annie was introducing you, um, you know, she mentioned about your bio and it is an impressive bio. Um and she talked about all of the books that you've authored, that you've co-authored, and 
you know, the job, the different, um, jobs that you've had and the volunteer work that you do and, um, the boards that you're on and, you know, the way that you give back. So, um, I guess as a writer, I would say, um, how, what is your process when I, and I know that you get asked that a lot, but whenever you are that busy and you are like, this is your first novel. Right. That, that, yeah. So, yes. um, maybe a little more touring, maybe it's a little bit different for you and, how is your workflow and has it changed because of that? Or do you find it the same? Um, um, the, the flow is pretty much the same. Um, I do my you know best work in the morning. So I get up early and get to it and do the writing in the morning. Cause that takes the most energy and cre creativity. And I think a lot of writers do that and, you know, leave the afternoon more for either editing or taking care of chores, like answering email and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, as far as this book goes, um, it's, uh, it's embarrassing how long it, this book took to write. Uh, the, the, the idea first occurred to me in 2006, and, uh, it, you know, it's coming out now, which means it took, you know, over 12 years to write this book, which is somewhat embarrassing since it only took four years to fight the Civil War. So, you know, more than three, <laughs> three times the length of the Civil War to write this thing. In my defense... It was very part-time, you know, part-time work. Um, sometimes this manuscript would sit in the, the drawer for, you know, weeks or months or even a year without my looking at it. And then I'd pull it back out and work, at, work on it again. Um, so it was a labor of love, but a very much part-time, you know, on and off labor of love. And those of you who've written books know that's often the case uh, with books. But the, the, um, the research fell, I would say, to three broad categories. A lot of book research. I've got on just myself about 250 books about Lincoln and, and Lincoln related books on my shelves here in my office. Uh, a lot of them are old books by people who knew Lincoln and that was vital to my research. Um, and then uh, internet research too. There's an amazing amount of scholarship on Lincoln uh, online, like the Abraham Lincoln papers at the Library of Congress. You can go online and see his papers and his handwriting, digital images of them, things like the Gettysburg Address and you know other stuff. And then a lot of travel. I've been to all the major and even minor Lincoln sites. I think everywhere he's been, I've been from Sinking Spring Farm where he was born in Kentucky to Ford Theater uh, where he of course was assassinated and every, every place in between. And I love that, you know, I love going to these Lincoln sites. So that was, that was a, that was a, a fun part of the yeah. research. We're lucky to have a living history uh, backcountry um, at our museum, which, you know, that always gives you context and, you know, Yes. It's, it's, it's nice to go to things like that. Now, we do have a question um, okay. on our chat. Let's okay. see if we find it again. Um, so, uh, Vanessa Roberts asks, she says she really enjoyed the humor of President Lincoln in your book. Are they actual quotes of his? Yeah, a lot of them are. So, I, as much as I possibly could, um, went to primary source documents for Lincoln and the other characters and, you know, looked hard at letters, speeches, articles from the time that quoted him. I worked very, very hard to build into the dialogue the actual words that these characters, including Lincoln, uh, said or, or wrote. And one thing I learned living in, uh, in Washington and being around politicians a lot is that when a politician's run across a good line, they use it over and over again. Believe me, they, they, use, they, they say the same things over and over again. And Lincoln was, was no exception, I, I know. Um, so sometimes I would move something that he said from one, you know, one setting to another and, and with confidence that he said it more than once. But, um, of course, I filled in a lot of the gaps in dialogue and scenes and events with my imagination. Um, and, and that's the details. And that's what makes it fiction. So if you're writing a term paper, you know, don't, you know, please, by all means, read all day. And I think it is, I, I, I do think it's an accurate depiction of Lincoln. Um, I tried very hard to make it an accurate depiction of Lincoln's administration, but it is historical fiction. So it's, you know, uh, don't put it in a term paper and, uh, and attribute it to Lincoln. <laughs> it might be John Cribb you're quoting. <laughs> <laughs> I gotcha. Yeah. Um, well, uh, let me get back to you. And, and I know that we've been on for probably pretty close to an hour. Um, <laughs> so I didn't mean to actually, go on that long. one of my questions was, um, what literary pilgrimages have you gone on? Not necessarily uh, literary, but definitely um, 
Abraham Lincoln censored. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of them, but I'll tell you, I'll give um, one good tip for I have for people is if when, next time you go to Washington, D.C., because I know a lot of us go to Washington every once in a while, a great place to go, if you're looking for a place that's kind of off the beaten path in, in Washington that you maybe haven't been to, is the, uh, the president, I think, they, I think they're calling it now President Lincoln's Cottage. Sometimes it's called Lincoln Cottage or the President's Cottage. It's up in Northwest DC. It's run by the Park Service. It's open to the public. And it was the Camp David of its day. And the Lincolns lived there during the summer um, when he was president. He actually spent a lot of time, um, maybe like a quarter of his presidency uh, living there. It was up on the edge of town, uh, it, uh, up in the hills, so it kind of caught the breezes. And he would commute, it was about three miles from the White House, and he would commute every day into the White House. Um, and you can go in, they give great tours. And this is one of those places where you can literally come into contact with Lincoln's world. Because when you go up, up and down the stairs there, uh, they let you put your hand on the, the banister, the staircase that he put his hand on. And so for a Lincoln geek like me, you know, that's a big deal to touch his world. <laughs> because, you know, most places they say, don't touch, don't touch. But you can, you know, you can put your hand on the stair uh, rail there. And come I the totally room. understand that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's a great place to go. Yeah. Um, and, you know, thank you for sharing that with us. Because, you know, everybody always wants to know um, the secrets that maybe other people don't know, you know. Like you said, off the beaten path. Yeah. Um, yeah. So... Okay. Um, well, I'll go through these a little bit more quickly. Um, okay. I'll answer quickly. Now, I know that, oh, no, that's okay. Um, so, if you could tell your younger writing self anything, what would that be? Well, um, I think, uh, you know, don't, don't get discouraged. Don't let, don't let any uh, discouragement hold you back and just kind of go plow ahead. And, you know, this book is kind of living proof that eventually, if you just keep butting your head against the wall, it'll, it, it'll happen one way or the other. It may not be the way you envisioned, but it will happen. And, and in my case, um, you know, it did take a while, but I couldn't be happier with this, the result. This is a beautiful book. The publisher did a fantastic uh, job with it. It's a beautiful cover. Uh, the interior is, is beautiful. And so the other, the other piece of advice I give writers is do it for love. Write for love, because uh, I've this is my first novel, but I've done a lot of books, and sometimes you make a little money, a lot of times you don't, and so do it for love. Don't yeah. do it for fame or money. Yeah. <laughs> do it for love. Well, um, okay, so on, uh, I have to come forward and say that this is not my idea. I have seen these on um, some other book chats and different online events. And I thought it, it would be neat, but I, I wanted to mention to some people, if they had not looked at your website yet, um, of course, I have perused it quite a bit. And um, you you talked about, all right, so you said, of course, everyone knows that you're very interested in Abraham Lincoln, but maybe they don't know how far that goes back. And so you mentioned um, that Abraham Lincoln, of course, has been a hero from history of uh, a hero of yours from history yeah. since boyhood. And so yeah. when you read about Abe growing up on the front, and you read about him growing up in the old, quote, Childhood of Famous Americans biography series. Now, I yeah. don't actually know about that series. I'm going to have to look that up. Well, yeah, it's been around a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we, meaning I, um, <laughs> thought that it would be fun to maybe ask you some kind of off the wall, but interesting questions about Lincoln. Okay. If you're, if yeah. you're game for that. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's see. So we always hear Abraham Lincoln, old Abe, you know, nicknames for him. Uh, is it true that Abraham Lincoln does not have a middle name? Yes. That is true. Yeah, no middle okay. name. That's very interesting. And he, had he, um, well, he's named after his grandfather. Yes. Um, who was, who was uh, killed by Indians in uh, Kentucky um, before Abe came along. And he usually, actually, usually Lincoln signed his papers, it's another piece of trivia, A. Lincoln. As, as a matter of fact, one of, the one of the really good biographies about Lincoln is just named A. Lincoln. Um, every once in a while for special documents like the Emancipation Proclamation, he would sign his full name, which is Abraham Lincoln. Yes. No middle name. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Whenever I was looking, uh, you know, I had never really seen, uh, I guess, just in passing his uh, signature before, but he's got a nice signature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, okay, so uh, let's see. Is it true, we have heard, you know, I, I've read, and I don't know if this is true or not, that Lincoln had a lot of different careers, uh, but um, is it true that Lincoln had a patent on an invention? Yes. He invented a device for floating steamboats off of sandbars and shoals and rivers when they got caught, you know, on the bottoms of rivers. That'd be very ha helpful around uh, Sumner and the lake. Yeah, Spartanburg too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and and down the beach. <laughs> yeah. So he did this before he was president, of course. And um, and you know, back then you had to submit a model with uh, your patent application. So uh, for he submitted this model, and then after he was elected president. Um, for a while, the patent office dug it up. They realized, you know, somebody said, oh, I invented that thing. So they had it on display. And the patent office still has it. You can go on their website or a lot of the websites. If you just Google Lincoln Invention, you'll see the model he submitted. Um, and I, I mentioned in my book that uh, later on in the, in the war, they turned the patent office into a hospital for um, wounded soldiers. And so uh, Lincoln, and, you know, it's just another, you know, like I say, all this stuff happened. He and Mary Lincoln go to visit of uh, the, uh, the, the wounded soldiers at the hospital there. And it's a very poignant scene. And I mentioned that nobody really comes to see his model anymore, like they did when he was first elected, because uh, the nation is on to more, far more serious matters now. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so um, we know, um, now I don't know if it's true or not, I would have to ask you, and you may or may not know, but you know that again, Lincoln had several different careers, um, but, uh, what kind of will did Lincoln have? <laughs> no will. He was one of those guys that never got around to, to you know, he was a lawyer, but he never got around to seeing yeah, a lawyer. That was <laughs> he, was, he was notoriously disorganized about some things. In his law practice in uh, Springfield, he, uh, he had a stack of paper on the floor with a note on top of it that said, if you can't find it anyplace else, look in this. And one, one time he had a, a young fellow, a clerk in his office, who was uh, decided to clean up because it had been so long since it had been, the office had been cleaned and he found in the corners uh, things growing, uh, you know, kind of piles of dirt and things growing out of them. <laughs> and of course, there were actually old packets of seeds that he had had for some sort of case and they just spilled open and things were growing. Yeah. Um, so he, uh, he wasn't necessarily that organized guy in some ways. I think it probably drove his associates crazy. Well, to to totally uh, swing the other way, instead of trivia, we do have a couple more questions uh, okay. for you from the chat. So okay. Sally Osborne would like to know um, how much, if you can tell us, do you think Mary Todd influenced his policies? Because I know she was a pretty opinionated. <laughs> yeah, she was. Well, I'll tell you, the main thing was uh, Mary Todd um, Lincoln I don't think Lincoln would have been president if it not for Mary Todd Lincoln. Um, when he was younger, uh, which, you know, she really encouraged him and pushed him. And I, I don't mean that in a bad way. And she had faith in him. And she would always tell people he's going to be president someday. She was ambitious for him. She was ambitious for herself and ambitious for him. Um, as far as her policies go, um, well, I think they pretty much, for the most part, saw eye to eye on policies. She was a Whig when they met. She, she told him, of, she said, I'm a violent little Whig. Um, and uh, that impressed him. And so uh, when, you know, when they got to the White House, though, because he was pulled into this, you know, this war and there's so much going on, I do think he came to rely on her less. And, you know, they, they probably talked about that stuff less than they had before the White House years. And that was probably, you know, uh, frustrating, frustrating to her because she was caught up when, once they got there in, in a world of, de of death and destruction that, that frankly overwhelmed her. Um, so. so, and then following up on that question, actually, um, Sally Asborn had another uh, question for you. And so again, in the, the influence realm, how much influence do you think that his cabinet had? Um, well, as I say, Lincoln was a great listener, and he certainly drew from that cabinet, um, uh, but it was mixed. Um, some of them, for example, uh, Stanton was an extremely effective Secretary of War, um, even though 
Uh, the one brush he had with Stanton in their attorney days uh, was a law a case in Cleveland where Stanton was very rude to Lincoln and even when, wouldn't even let him be in the courtroom. Uh, but Lincoln, to his credit, knew that this was a man who would do a great job running the War Department and hired him. Um, William Henry Seward, as Secretary of State, um, at the beginning of the administration, thought he was going to be the power behind the throne and was going to call the shots. Uh, Lincoln quickly disabused him of that notion. They ended up becoming good friends. Uh, they both loved a good joke, good story. Um, uh, but, uh, and so, uh, they straightened that out, but Lincoln, uh, I do think he benefited from these men's opinions, but in the end, Lincoln was in charge of that ship of state. So he would listen to them and then he would, uh, he would make up his mind. And, uh, Seward, uh, is interesting. You know, he came into that, the cabinet thinking, I'm going to call the shots. And then several weeks later, he was writing, writing to his wife, uh, the president is the best of us. Uh, so Lincoln, Lincoln, in his own quiet way, was very self-confident. At times he was, at times he, he was, I'm sh I know he thought to himself at times, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm, I'm in over my head here. But in the end, he had a reserve of self-confidence that carried him, him through. So he, as I say, he was that captain of that ship of state. Yeah, yeah. That's a great uh, question. Uh, okay. This is a just curious question. Um, and I don't know this person is but did tad really have a cleft palate oh yeah yes okay. he did and that was from vanessa roberts that was oh uh, yeah great <laughs> yes great question he did and it caused a speech impediment and if you read old abe you'll you'll see in the dialogue he he doesn't form his words quite correctly um and uh it was much tad was very frustrated at times when people couldn't understand him of course his parents could understand him and people who got to know him could understand him. Tad was a lively fellow. He was, uh, you know, he was always, full, you know, they'd turn around and he was doing things like racing the goats. You know, he made, roped the goats up to the chairs and turned them into sleds and racing through the White House, that kind of stuff. Um, taking his little carpenter set and nailing chairs to the floor and that kind of stuff. Um, Lincoln was very attached to him. The Lincolns lost uh, two sons during their marriage. They lost uh, Eddie, their son Eddie, uh, when he was around four years old, uh, when they lived in Springfield. And when they got to the White House, uh, their son Willie died of typhoid fever. And that's really, I think, in what really kind of devastated Mary the most. She was never the same after that. It's kind of downhill from there after that. Um, and Tad, uh, their older son, uh, uh, Bob, was off at, at school and then later in the Army. So Tad was left alone. And so Lincoln and Tad grew very close uh, to each other in those uh in those, uh, those last years. Yeah. Um, and I, I have a question. Um, this, this one is very interesting. Um, it, it touches on a little bit of um, sort of at the, or while you were uh, giving the, the presentation, um, you touched on sort of the racial element of the opposition to Lincoln. Um, uh, could you maybe tell us a little bit about Lincoln's ancestry and sort of where that came from? Was it in relation to racism? Or, um, his ancestry, I guess, maybe up into Virginia. And I think the question is probably based in, uh, and I could be wrong about this, but possibly uh, Melungeon or, uh, you know, the, I, I don't want to go too far into that because I don't know yeah. the correct terminology exactly, but. Yeah, well, there, yeah, there are all these, yeah, there are all these theories about, um, and different, you know, I was in North Carolina given, uh, a couple of talks at Labor Day weekend, and uh, you know, there's there uh, several different spots in North Carolina where they are, will, will tell you very confidently that Lincoln was actually born in North Carolina, and there are all these theories about his ancestors. Yeah. Um, uh, most, you know, most Lincoln scholars are are confident he was born in, in Kentucky. I, uh, his parents were um, the 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 church that he grew up in was anti-slavery, um, and his uh, you know one reason that his, he gave for his uh, parents leaving Kentucky and moving into Indiana was, uh, was uh, problems with slavery. Um, Lincoln was what was known as an anti-slavery man. He was not an abolitionist going into the war. Um, he, like many people, uh, felt like that if slavery be, could be contained to the Southern states and not uh, be allowed to spread into the Western territories, it eventually would die out of, of its, own, its own death um, for a lot of reasons, but it was, you know, it was just a failing economic system. A lot of people believed. 
um, uh, because it exhausted the soil and all that kind of stuff. So if, so if it were contained, it would, it would die. So that was the anti-slavery view. The abolitionists, of course, wanted to, to abolish slavery right away. Now, eventually, in the end, Lincoln becomes an abolitionist because he does sign the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, but that is, the, uh, that is what triggers the Civil War. And, you know, um, people always kind of debate about the causes of the Civil War and all that. And, you know, it's like any other big conflict. People went to war for different reasons. Um, a lot of people who went to war in the South didn't own slaves. Um, you know, they, they went to war because as far as they were concerned, Lincoln was ra raising an invasion army and there was a, an army coming at them. Um, but I think there's no doubt if you read the, the contemporary reports of the time, it was slavery, the, that, that, that argument over slavery and whether it was going to be uh, allowed to spread out of the South really was the rub. Okay. Um, yeah. And Lincoln it's hated slavery. Any, yeah. Not anything in his ancestry. I, it was, yeah. it, it, <laughs> yeah, I don't, you know, there, who knows? Lincoln, it's kind of funny. Lincoln was not particularly interested in his ancestry. Um, and uh, according to his law partner, Billy Herndon, he, uh, Herndon said after, of course, Lincoln was gone, that uh, Lincoln at one time had told him that he thought maybe his mother was illegitimate. Um, now that's Herndon, so we don't know. And uh, nobody, nobody, of course, knows for absolutely, absolutely sure. But that, that continues to be a, you know, kind of an interesting thing to think about and talk about. And we have another question from Sally, if you have time. Yeah. Do you have time? Okay, yeah. I just want to make sure. Sorry if I'm taking yeah. too long. Um, what was his relationship with Seward? Uh, was it antagonistic, mutual, mutually beneficiary? Or yeah. Know? No, it started out um, somewhat, uh, as I say, not antagonistic, but Su uh, uh, William Henry Seward, he went by Henry, Henry Seward thought that he really kind of was going to be able to uh, be the power behind the throne. And, uh, you know, he was Secretary of State, which, which in a lot of uh, countries, that was kind of the equivalent of being the premier. I mean, you really were, uh, you know, a, a power behind the throne. Um, but Lincoln, as I say, disabused him of that, of that notion. And, um, and, and then they become friends, uh, one of his closer uh, friends in the cabinet. As I say, Seward wrote his wife saying the, the president is the best of us. Uh, at the very end of the war, uh, Seward is in a, a bad carriage accident. And uh, I, I depict this in my book and is, is laid up in his bed and with a, a big old iron thing around his jaw and everything. And uh, Lincoln makes a point when he gets back from Richmond to, uh, to go, go to his house and visit with him, actually lies down on the bed beside him to make it easier for him to, to talk to him. And I uh, was very, um, you know, uh, uh, very concerned about him. So they, they do become friends. Uh, you, you know, I don't know if y'all saw the, the film Lincoln by um, Steven Spielberg several years ago, but in, in general, I felt they did a really good job of, um, of historical accuracy. One thing they did not get right in that film is that in that film, Henry, Henry, uh, William Henry Seward is very dour and always kind of like glaring and frowning at, at Lincoln kind of sternly, you know, uh, talking to him. In real life, Lincoln, you know, often Seward just would stay behind after the cabinet meetings and light a cigar and, and, and they would uh, tell jokes and laugh and, and you know, they swap stories and stuff like that. They, yeah. they enjoyed each other's sense of humor. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Um, well, well, we'll end with a couple of fun uh, trivia questions for you. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see. What domesticated animal uh, was Lincoln particularly <laughs> fond of? <laughs> well, he, uh, he, they had a lot of animals. They had goats in the White House. They had ponies. Uh, his son had a turkey, which Lincoln famed. He started the tradition of, um, of uh, pardoning turkeys in the White House. Uh, oh, wow. They were going to kill the turkey. So I sent him the turkey for the holidays, and they were going to eat it. And Tad came running in saying, you know, you got to save the turkey. So Lincoln oh. wrote out a pardon for the turkey. Uh, they, his name, the, turkey's, the turkey's name was Jack, um, but uh, I think uh, the answer you're looking for is cats, uh, because Lincoln uh, did like cats, and he and Tad would often get down on the floor and play with cats and uh, together. That was kind of one, one way they spent time together. Yeah, I read a, uh, a quote from um, his wife, and it said that there were two cats that he would sometimes feed on the table. Yeah. on the dinner table and she yeah. was not very fond of no. that. Yeah. She not that at all. <laughs> yeah, she got mad because he would like show up for dinner and just like his uh you know his undershirt and stuff. And she was raised in a very proper yes. wealthy household and yes. and so she didn't like she didn't understand that stuff. Feeding cats on the table and stuff. She didn't she didn't get it. <laughs> so um now 
obviously his hat is iconic. Mm-hmm. And we know that in part it was, I mean, he was already very tall, six foot four, six foot five. Yeah. And this helped uh, with him, his stature seeming very tall and imposing, yeah. and imposing but noticeable. Yeah. Um, but uh, do you know what else he used his hat for? Yes. Yeah. He <laughs> would, it was, it was basically a filing cabinet. <laughs> he would, uh, he would carry papers and little, you know, notes and things that he, uh, letters sometimes in his hat. He would tuck them up in there yeah. and carry around in them. And uh, yeah, he was kind of famous for that, that he would put them in his hat. I think sometimes he would, he would put stuff up in his hat thinking that it w- would like seat down into his brain. <laughs> <He's lost laughs> <up there. laughs> that reminds <laughs> me of a Garfield cartoon I saw about uh, learning by osmosis. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Learning by osmosis. So yeah, he did do that. He would he would uh, put uh, put papers and stuff in his uh, in his hat. Yeah. Well, let me see. Um, okay, I don't think we have any more Facebook or uh, Zoom questions. Okay. But so if there's anything else you'd like to add at the end, I do have one last question for you. Okay. And uh, there may be many. I don't know, but uh, and you may have already told us your favorite. But do you have a favorite saying of Lincoln's? Um, let's see. Uh, I, you know, one of the sayings I like a lot, and um, to be honest, it may be apocryphal, although I believe it comes from his cousin, Dennis Hanks, who grew up with him in the wilderness. And uh, Hanks was a colorful uh, character, and he gave lots of interviews about uh, Abe after he Lincoln was shot and gone, and the more interviews he came, uh, he gave, the, the more it seemed that uh, Dennis Hanks was like taking credit for all kinds of things, you know, teaching him to read and write. And, and, <laughs> but anyway, uh, he did, he was, you know, they, he was Lincoln's cousin, they, they were, uh, you know, an important figure in his early life. And um, he said that when Lincoln was young, he used to say, my best friend is a man who can get me a book, because, you know, books were scarce on the frontier, and Lincoln really would walk Miles, literally, he would walk miles through the woods to lay his hands on a book. Uh, that's how eager he was to learn. So, uh, Dennis Hanks said he would say, my best friend is a man who can get me a book. And I love that. I love that, too. I love that That's saying. wonderful. And he yeah. always seemed like he was just very dedicated to, he was going to keep trying, uh, with his wife's help, too. Yeah. <laughs> he was going to keep trying until he was successful. With yeah, he used to, yeah, another thing he used to say, if, if you have time to say real fast, he, during the, you know, the war was just a long, hard, terrible slog. And for a while, I mean, for a long time, it looked like the North was going to win. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people in the North said, this stop, this is not worth it, let the South go. And Lincoln said, no, we're going to see this through. And he used to tell people, he said, I'm like a man trying to keep up a tent in a storm. And he said, um, I get it staked down to the ground and the wind comes along and it blows out a tent stake and I grab a hammer and I peg it back down. And as soon as I get that stake in, the wind blows out another peg, a stake. So I'll run around and I'll peg it back down. And as soon as I get it in, the wind will blow out another tent stake, so I'll peg it back down. And he would say to people, that's all I do all day long is I keep pegging away, pegging away. And that's all I mean to keep doing is keep pegging away. And boy, he is a model of perseverance. If you want to study perseverance, study uh, Lincoln. And he pegged away. Through and four long, hard years. Yeah, I would follow that up with get this book because we all need help nailing down those pegs right now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love that. Yes. I do. <laughs> yeah. So it is nice to see you know the perseverance, and I've read um, about a quarter of the book. I only got it yesterday. It's very good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, we were working with tech issues today, as I mentioned earlier, but. Um, this has been very wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. So I, much I had a great time. time. And I, I hope time. that for your next novel or whatever book that you decide to write, um, that we can have you in person because our uh, in-person book events are great. So. I, would love, I would love to do that. My favorite museums are local museums. Yes. Where, where people are passionate about the local history. I, and I'm assuming... My, sorry, go ahead. Well, I would rather, I would rather go, you know to a local museum in, in Sumter or Spartanburg uh, than, than, than the Louvre, or most, the, most days, because yeah. then you get, you get somebody talking to you who really is passionate about uh, yes, local exactly. history. Yeah. And, um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. But, <laughs> 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 um, 
Um, I will say just to follow that up, um, because of COVID, of course, uh, we uh, don't have, you know, the book signing in person, but we do have signed book plates. Yes. And um, John was nice enough to get this to us really quickly, and we appreciate that. So, um, again, I would just like to, uh, you know, go over the importance of, by the way, uh, John is a South Carolina native. <laughs> yep. Um, so, you are helping all local because we uh, want to support our book civilian that supports jobs in our community. And, of course, um, supporting John by buying his wonderful book. And um, again, you can, the only way uh, in Sumter at least that you can get the book with the signed book plates is um, through our local books a million. Uh, Tracy is the manager there and she's wonderful. She works with us uh, with, I believe all of our book signings uh, and she will have the book plate, so um, there will be a place for you to, uh, we'll put something in the link on Facebook, um, and also you can buy them, just go to booksmillion.com, uh, search for Sumter as your local store, and uh, order this book, and you can also call 803-773-1091, and that is the local number for Books A Million, and they do buy online, pick up in store, and Tracy... Uh, and her employees are wonderful, and they're happy to bring it out to the curb for you because I know the mall is a long ways to walk. <laughs> <laughs> and so, since I've gone through all that, John, again, thank you so much. And you. Um, we can't wait to see you again. This was fun. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it. I would love to come back sometime. Okay, wonderful. I wonder if there's any housekeeping I need to think of. I think we're good. Okay, y'all stay dry. If possible. All right, you too. And right. uh, we will talk to you soon. Thank you Thank so you. much. All See right. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.